I want to take two texts, if I may do that. Psalm 40, verse 7, Colossians 3, verse 11. Then said I, Lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me. And this is a, this is a prophecy of the Lord Jesus. In Colossians 3.11, the word of God says that there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, that was the nations, the people that did not speak Greek, a barbarian, Scythian, that was the eastern nations, bond or free, but Christ is all and in all. And that, that statement, Christ is all, and the second half of it, and in all, related to Psalm 40, verse 7, in the volume of the book, it is written of me. What is the Bible all about? Well, to some people it's a book of religion. To others it's a book of ethics or morals. To some people it's mainly history, history of the Jewish nation, the early church, and a person called Jesus of Nazareth. What is the Bible all about? Some friends of mine were in Russia uh, several years ago. They were in Kiev in Ukraine. They saw a bookstore, so they went into this bookstore and they inquired as to whether they sold Bibles. And the clerk said, yes, they did. And fortunately, they asked to see a copy of the Bible, and so they brought a Bible. And as they browsed through it, they were horrified to see what had been done to the Word of God. All the miracles had been deleted, and there were some footnotes explaining that since there is no God, there are no, there's no such thing as miracles. And when it came to the New Testament, all they had in the New Testament was the story of Jesus, in part, up until his death on the cross. That's where the Bible ended. And then there was a note saying, Jesus was a good man and a lover of peace, and that we should follow his example. Now, that was the Bible that they were selling. But even although we have the complete Word of God, many people are reading it with as little... Uh, you know, gaining as little help from it as if they had that Bible I was describing over in Kiev. What is the Bible really all about? Well, in the volume of the book, it is written of me. Need I say, do I have to say that the Bible is all about Jesus? Christ is all. Christ is in all. Let's explore this a little together, shall we? You know, Jesus divided the Old Testament into the Law, the Prophets, and the Psalms. In the book of Colossians, chapter 2, it talks about shadows and bodies. You wouldn't trade a $20 bill for the best shadow of a $20 bill in all the world. Indeed, you wouldn't trade a $20 bill for the best shadow of a thousand dollar bill. You wouldn't trade the reality for the shadow. But to some extent we've been doing this in spiritual things, and I have no doubt that some here are doing it today. We're looking at the shadows, and we're not seeing the reality, which is Jesus Christ. In the law, Israel, the great Passover night and the feast that was instituted then, which is still carried on among the Jewish people today. But we have this interesting commentary on it in Corinthians. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Then there was the feast following the Passover, the feast of unleavened bread. And so we read again, let us keep the feast, not with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. And that's a feast we keep not for a few days as Israel did and does, but for the whole of life, the unleavened bread, 
of sincerity and truth. They crossed the Red Sea. It says in Corinthians, they were baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Moses was the mediator of the old covenant, even as Jesus is the mediator of the new. And we are not baptized unto Moses nor to any other earthly being, but we are baptized unto Christ, into Christ, in his name, because of who he is. But the crossing of the Red Sea was a picture of Christian baptism. Then in the wilderness, the manna came down, as we know, every day, a double portion on the sixth day, so they would not have to gather on the seventh. For 40 years, in John chapter 6, there are 13 references to the fact that Jesus Christ is the bread of God, or the bread of life. He who came down from heaven to give life unto the world. So the manna falling every day was a picture of Jesus Christ who came once and for all to the earth. The Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Neither came I of myself, Christ said, but the Father sent me. And then it says, they drank of that spiritual rock that went with them. But that rock was Christ, the water they drank. Do you remember how the nobles with their staves, they dug in the ground and they sang, Spring up, O well, sing you unto it. And the water came and flowed. And they drank of that water that came. But the New Testament explains that that rock that was smitten from which the water came, that was Christ. That was Christ. And the tabernacle, and later on the temple, with all its furniture and all its design, spoke of Christ. Every whit of God's temple speaks of God's glory. And that's a study all by itself. If you think of the veil, that speaks of his body. It says so in the book of Hebrews. You think of the candlesticks. While well, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. You can think of anything in the temple. The incense altar, the mercy seat, the ark of the testimony. The mercy seat, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So we have a mercy seat today. In the Old Testament, God said, there I will meet with you and there I will commune with you. And God meets and communes with his people today at the unseen throne of grace. So I say again, these things in the Old Testament, they were shadows. The reality is all found in Christ. In the law, the keeping of the Sabbath, the New Testament explains that Jesus Christ is the Sabbath. He fulfilled that. Come unto me and I will give you rest. And the main feature of the Sabbath, of course, it was the Sabbath of rest. And we find that in Christ. So it's not one day a week, it's the whole of life for the believer that we rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him and we fret not ourselves in any wise because of him that does evil. And we wait on the Lord. What a beautiful thought. Rest in the Lord. Wait patiently for him. As someone said that in the average Christian life, the main problem is that I'm in a hurry and God isn't. Why, Moses was 80 years old before God did anything significant with him. And some would think it all has to happen by the time we're 21. We have to give God time. Now, Christ is all. In the volume of the book it is written of me. In the Psalms. You know, sometimes among Jewish people when they talk about the Psalms, they meant the five poetical books from Job to the Song of Solomon. In the book of Job we read, I know that my Redeemer lives and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth and though after my skin, that is after my death, worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God whom I shall see for myself and not another. My reins within me are consumed with earnest desire for that day. 
in the Psalms, everywhere you turn, Psalm 2, why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, that is, against his Christ, saying, let us break their bands asunder, let us cast away their cords from us. He that sits in the heavens shall laugh, the Lord shall have them in derision. And then it says he will speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Then God speaks, yet have I set my son, yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. Then the son speaks, I'll declare for a decree, the Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Ask of me and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron, thou shalt break them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Then God says, Kings and judges, be wise, be instructed. Kiss the son, lest he be angry, and you perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. And you go up to the other psalm. Psalm 19 speaks of Jesus Christ, that God would not leave his soul in Hades. His flesh would not see corruption. Psalm 22, there are 24 references or prophecies of the Lord Jesus in that one chapter, beginning with the well-known words from the Gospels, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And then they pierce my hands and my feet. They look and stare upon me in Psalm 22. Then in other Psalms, while there's something there about Judas Iscariot, yea, mine own familiar friend, in whom I trusted, who ate of my bread, has lifted up his heel against me. And again, another reference in one of the Psalms, Psalm 129, the plowers plowed upon my back, they made long their furrows. Psalm 72, Psalm 78, we call them Messianic Psalms, Psalms that speak of the Lord Jesus. And the book of Proverbs, yes, even in the book of Proverbs, it says, who has ascended up to heaven or descended? Who has gathered the wind in his fist? Who has gathered the waters in the garment? What is his name? And what is his son's name? if thou canst tell. So God had a son. I remember sharing that with a Jew one time. He was absolutely flabbergasted. God had a son? Yes. What is his name? Well, we know what his name is. His name is Jesus. But they didn't know in Old Testament days. When you come to the prophetical books, the book of Isaiah has sometimes been called the fifth gospel because there's so much in that one book about the Lord Jesus. Chapter 7 talks about the virgin and chapter 9 talks about his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. On the increase of his government and of peace there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with justice and with judgment from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. And then you go through Isaiah chapter 11, talks about the rod and the root of the stem of Jesse. And David, you remember, Jesse's son, and Jesus Christ of the line of David from the family of Jesse, just as Isaiah chapter 11. And then the time, I just don't have the time because it would be more than one study all by itself to take the book of Isaiah. But there's certain portions that stand out in my thinking. There's one chapter that says this, Look upon Zion, the city of our solemnities. Thine eyes shall see Jerusalem a quiet habitation, a tabernacle that shall not be taken down. Not one of the stakes thereof shall ever be removed, neither shall any of the cords thereof be broken. But there the glorious Lord shall be unto us a place of broad rivers and streams, a wind shall go no galley with oars, neither shall gallant ship pass thereby. The city of the great king, Jesus called it over in the Gospel of Matthew. There the glorious Lord shall be unto us a place of broad rivers and streams. Wind shall go no galley with oars, neither shall gallant ship pass thereby. Or Isaiah 40, or Isaiah 42. Or Isaiah 53, where there are 45 separate prophecies of the Lord Jesus Christ. Or Isaiah 54, all thy children shall be taught of the Lord, 
and great should be the peace of thy children. And Jesus Christ quoted that in the Gospel of John as being fulfilled now in his people. Oh yes, blessed are those that are taught of the Lord. You know what it says in Ephesians chapter 4? You have not so learned Christ, if so be that you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. If you are a Christian believer, you have been taught by Christ. Because Paul wrote those words to the church at Ephesus, they had not seen Christ, they hadn't heard Christ in the flesh, but they have been taught by Christ through the Holy Spirit of God, and so have we. Isaiah chapter 61, Jesus Christ quoted that in the synagogue at Nazareth and applied it to himself. This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. And then we could jump from one of the prophetical books to another in the Old Testament. And the testimony is fantastic. You turn to Daniel, Messiah the Prince. Ezekiel talks about Jesus Christ. God said, I will overturn, overturn, overturn it until he come whose right it is and I will give it him which means that God's going to keep turning over, overturning the political systems of the world until Jesus Christ comes. And there's a day coming, according to Revelation 11, when all the kingdoms of this world shall become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. That day is coming. It's an exciting thought. The earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. They shall not learn war anymore. There's a new day coming. It's called the day of God. It's called the day of Christ. It's called the day of the Lord. And man's day will end. And God's day will begin. And the prophets spoke about it. Jeremiah said, The Lord has done a new thing. God has created a new thing in the earth. A woman shall compass a man. And the word man there means a mighty man or a man of power. A new thing. Jesus. And then, when in Amos we read about Jesus Christ and Obadiah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zechariah, many prophecies of the Lord Jesus Christ and Zechariah. Remember the Lord talked about them giving 30 pieces for his price in the book of Zechariah. And then God called to the city of Jerusalem, your king is coming, God said. He's meek and lowly and sitting upon an ass and upon a colt, the full of an ass. Your king is coming, Zechariah said. And they didn't recognize him when he came because he did what the prophet said he would do. He rode on an ass. And so they didn't recognize him. In the volume of the book, it is written of me, I delight to do thy will, O my God. What are these wounds in thine hand? Those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. That was Zechariah. Awake, O sword, Zechariah, awake, O sword, against my shepherd and against the man that is my fellow. Smite the shepherd, smite the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered abroad, and I will turn my hand upon the little one. And when it happened, they didn't understand it. The prophets had said it, but they didn't understand it. Micah, but thou, Bethlehem, the fruitful, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from of old, from the days of eternity. Or Malachi. Behold, the day comes that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yes, and all that do wickedly shall be stubble, and the day that comes shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings. That's the last chapter of the Old Testament, isn't it? Yes, it is. Unto you that fear my name. Here's a beautiful thought from Malachi. Then they that feared the, the Lord spoke often one to another, and the Lord hearkened and heard, and a book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared the Lord and that thought upon his name. And they shall be mine, saith the Lord, and that they want to make up my jewels, and I will spare them as a man spares his own son that serves him. The Old Testament is all about Jesus in the law, in the prophets, in the Psalms. And that's what Christ said in Luke chapter 24, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. In the volume of the book, 
it is written of me. Christ is all and in all. And so when we read the Old Testament scriptures, we should be looking for Christ. You know, sometimes we read the Bible for the wrong reasons. That's why we get so little out of Bible study sometimes. Because we're not aware of Psalm 40, verse 7, or Colossians 3, verse 11. And what about the New Testament? How does Matthew begin? Matthew one twenty one says, Thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. And how does that book end? Well, it ends with Jesus and his disciples, and he's commanding them to take his gospel and preach it to the ends of the earth, and then to train the converts to observe everything Jesus Christ taught. What about Mark? The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. That's how it begins. How does it end? It ends this way. Mark 16. It says, Jesus Christ began to reproach his disciples because of their hardness of heart and their unbelief because they did not believe those who had seen him after he was risen from the dead. And then he commanded them to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Luke, Luke chapter 1, you have John the Baptist and the angel of God speaking to his parents. And then it says about John that he was going to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. And that was his ministry. I remember years ago being at an intervarsity camp in Lake of the Woods. And um, one night, several of us were sitting out just kind of watching the sky. It was a beautiful night, no moon, but the stars were very bright. And suddenly over in one corner of the sky, we saw uh, what we call them shooting stars. Just a streak of light shot across the sky. And all our eyes were focused on that place until that streak of light disappeared and the sky was as it had been before. And then just before we took our eyes off that portion of sky, a brilliant, brilliant meteorite went flashing through that same area of the sky. We wouldn't have seen it the way we did if we hadn't have seen that first little streak of light that shot across the sky. And, that, and just then God spoke to my heart about John the Baptist and Jesus. Jesus said, I have greater witness than that of John. You were willing for a season to rejoice in his light, but I have greater witness than that of John. And our highest ambition in life as Christian believers ought to be just a little streak of light attracting people's attention to the greater light, the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, that's in Luke chapter 1, chapter 2, when the, the angel spoke to Mary, the mother of Jesus. He said, The Holy Ghost will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of you shall be called the Son of God. That holy thing which shall be born of you shall be called the Son of God. And then how does Luke end? It ends with two men rode to Emmaus. They're walking. Jesus comes. They don't recognize him. He's a stranger to them. And finally, he says things like this. He says, O oh, fools and slow of heart, to believe all that the prophets have spoken, ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And a little later on in the same chapter, 24 of Luke, he's talking now to the whole group of the disciples. And he said, These are the words that I spoke unto you when I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which are written in the law of Moses and in the Psalms and in the prophets, concerning me. Then he opened their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. And John, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of man. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. That's all found in John chapter 1. What do we find in the last chapter of John? Well, in the last chapter of John, we have the Lord Jesus saying to Peter, and really indirectly saying to all of us, Follow thou me. Follow thou me. And the last statement of the book of John is just simply this, that there were many, many other things that Jesus Christ did, that if they were to be written every one, the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. The four Gospels, they're all about Jesus. And the book of Acts, Acts chapter 1, what does it say there? Well, it says Jesus Christ, he showed himself to his disciples after his passion for 40 days by many infallible proofs. Then in the great second chapter of Acts, what does it say? It says, this Jesus has God raised up, 
whereof we all are witnesses, therefore being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has shed forth this, which you now see here. Pentecost was the activity of Christ. He did it. He did it. When he breathed on his disciples over there in the Gospel of John, they did not, in my opinion, receive the Spirit of God then. And I'll tell you why. If they did, Thomas was not with them. Did that mean they all received the Spirit and Thomas didn't? It creates a problem. I think that was just a sort of embryo form of what was to happen on the day of Pentecost when the risen Christ breathed on his disciples in a powerful, dynamic way. Jesus Christ has shed forth this which you now see and hear. And how does the book of Acts end? It ends with Paul dwelling in his own hired house, receiving all that came into him. And what did he do there? Well, it says, From morning till evening he persuaded them concerning Jesus out of the law and the prophets. Could you preach about Jesus Christ from morning till evening if all you had was the Old Testament? But somehow, Paul was able to. I think he saw a lot more of Jesus in the Old Testament scriptures than we see today. From morning till Till evening, persuading them concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ. The book of Romans chapter 1, oh, he talks about the gospel of God concerning his son Jesus Christ, who was made of the seed of David according to the flesh and declared or determined to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. That's how it all begins. How does it end? Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel. And the, the mystery, he says, according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began, but is now made manifest, he said, and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. He's talking about Jesus still at the end of the book in the 16th chapter. 1 Corinthians, or 1 Corinthians chapter 1, it says you are enriched by him in all efforts and in all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that you come behind in no gift waiting for the revelation, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful by whom you were called unto the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Well, that's how the book begins. 1 Corinthians, how does it end? Well, it ends this way. If any man love not our Lord Jesus Christ, let him be accursed. Our Lord is coming. That's how it ends. Second Corinthians chapter 1, all he says is our suffering abounds by Christ, so our consolation abounds by Christ. And then he says in the same first chapter, the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by us, even by me and Silvanus and Timotheus, was not yea and nay, but in him was yea, for all the promises of God in him are yea and amen unto the glory of God by us. Then in the second chapter, Oh, he says, thanks be unto God who always causes us to triumph in Christ and makes manifest the Savior of his knowledge by us in every place. For we are unto God a sweet fragrance of Christ. And how does that book end? The 13th chapter, 2 Corinthians. Oh, Paul says, examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know you not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except you be reprobates. And how does the chapter really end? That chapter 13th the 2 Corinthians. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Ghost be with you all. It's all about Jesus. Galatians chapter 1 verse 4 it says, Jesus Christ gave himself for our sins that he might redeem us from all iniquity. He gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father. And how does Galatians end? Well, it ends with that wonderful thought, verse 14. God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ for by the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. Ephesians, there are 74 references to Jesus Christ in that short book of six chapters. It's all about Jesus, and that's not unusual. In the volume of the book, it is written of me. So in Ephesians chapter 1, it says we are accepted in God's beloved Son. Ephesians chapter 6, grace be with all them that love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. That's how it ends. Philippians 1.11, here's a great thought. Being filled with the fruits of righteousness which are by Jesus Christ unto the glory and praise of God. 
121, to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Chapter 4, the last chapter of the book, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. My God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. It's all about him. Colossians, oh, chapter 1 of Colossians, it's such a rich chapter. It says Jesus Christ was the firstborn of all creation. And that does not mean that Jesus Christ was the first one God created. The context explains what is meant by the term. It says he was the firstborn of all creation for by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body of the church, the firstborn of all creation. That's Colossians chapter 1. In the last chapter of Colossians, Paul is asking for prayer that he might be able to speak the mystery of Christ clearly. It's all about Jesus. First Thessalonians chapter 1, remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and our Father. And further on in the same chapter he says, You turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his Son from heaven, even Jesus who delivered us from the wrath to come. And how does that book end? First Thessalonians 5, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he that calls you who also will do it. Second Thessalonians chapter 1, what does it say there? Well, among other things it says this, And to you are troubled, rest with us, when our Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power, when he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe. What a statement. And that day is coming. Rather, Jesus is coming. To you who are troubled, rest. It's not going to stay the way it is. Then in the last chapter of that book he says, I beseech you by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ that you withdraw yourselves from every brother that walks disorderly and not according to, to the tradition that he received from us. By the name of Jesus, there's only one Christ. So we should be of the same mind one toward another. The same argument Paul brought up in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, I think the 10th verse. He was beseeching those people by the name of Jesus that they would all speak the same thing, that they'd be perfectly drawn together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Then, 1 Timothy, Paul says, I was a persecutor, a blasphemer, and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord is exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. And how does the book end? He says, concerning Jesus Christ, which in his times he, God, shall show, who is the blessed and only potentate, that's power holder, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Second Timothy chapter 1. He says, Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testament of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began, but now is made manifest. Then in the last chapter, Second Timothy, he's beseeching these people by the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, to preach the word, to be instant in season and out of season. And then the book of Titus. Well, it's a short book, but it's a marvelous book. The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Then the next chapter... It says, it's not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, 
which he shed on us abundantly. I see the marginal reading says richly. How? Through, through Jesus Christ our Savior, that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Well, that's the book of Titus in short and brief. Philemon. It's a very, very short book. One chapter. But four times in that one chapter, three or four times, Paul describes himself as being a prisoner of Jesus Christ. A bond slave, a willing prisoner to the Son of God. Hebrews. Oh, what a book. I sat down sometimes and spent, just gone through the whole book of Hebrews, just letting my soul soak it out. It's so beautiful. God, who at sundry times and in divers manners, spoken time past unto the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high, being made so much better than the angels. That's how it all begins. How does it end? Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ. James, the servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's how the book begins. Then in the last chapter, anointing the sick with oil in the name of the Lord. And who is the Lord in the New Testament but Jesus? 1 Peter chapter 1, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. What a beautiful thought. And you know, 1 Peter, it's another one of those books that sometimes it just lays a hold in my heart to such an extent I simply have to spend hours with it. But in the last chapter he says this, the elders which are among you I exhort, whom also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Jesus, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd, that's Jesus, and when the chief shepherd shall appear, you shall receive a crown of glory that fades not away. Second Peter chapter 1. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, according as his divine power has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue, whereby or by whom the marginal reading says are given unto us, exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that's in the world through lust. And how does it end? 2 Peter 3.18 But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's all about him. In the volume of the book, it is written of me. 1 John chapter 1 If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. And how does it end? It ends by saying, We know that the Son of God has come and has given us an understanding that we may know him that is true, and we are in him that is true, even in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. And in Second John, he says, If a man transgresses and abides not in the doctrine of Christ, he doesn't have God. And Third John, he talks about the truth for the truth's sake which dwells in us, which abides with us. And who is the truth but Jesus according to John 14, 6? And then the book of Jude, one chapter. And he says, he talks about the world and the way they live. He says they're sensual and they don't have the Spirit of God. But you, beloved, and the word beloved means divinely loved ones, but you, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. What's the book of Revelation all about? It's all about Jesus Christ. Do you know there are 75 references in that one book to the work and activity of the Lord Jesus? 75 references. It begins by saying the revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave unto him. 
to show unto his servants the things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. So it really isn't the revelation of John. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave unto him. And then Revelation 1, 5, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Revelation 1, 7, behold, he comes with clouds and every eye shall see him. And they also who pierced him and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Revelation chapter 11, I quoted that verse earlier, I think. That comes to my mind again. And the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. And he shall reign forever and ever. And the nations were angry, and thy wrath has come, and the time of the dead that they should be judged, and that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants the prophets, and to them that fear thy name, small and great, and shouldest destroy them that corrupt the earth. Jesus, he's coming back. And you know what we read in Revelation 19? It says the, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And the reason there's so much confusion sometimes and the interpretations people come up with from the Bible and particularly from the prophetic scriptures is because we haven't got the key. Some people think the Jew is the key to the Bible. And somebody's got a different idea to that again. Here are all kinds of notions. Dear friends, if we miss Jesus, we miss it all. He's the key. He's the key. Colossians 3.11, Christ is all. Now, can I apply that for a few moments before we break up? If Christ is all, and if Christ is in all, then you don't need any more than you've got. Did you realize that? What kind of Christ do you have? You have half of Christ living in your heart. You have his head, his arm, his leg. Half of Christ or a whole Christ? What Paul says? Don't you know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, which is in you, which you have of God? And you're not your own, for you're bought with a, with a price. Listen, what kind of Holy Spirit lives in you? Half a Holy Spirit? To ask the question, I think, should be to answer it. I have a whole Christ. I have the entire Holy Spirit living within me. All right? So what does that mean then, where I live? It means that Christ is all. And I've got all that I need. You know, in Colossians 2.10 it says, You are complete in Him. And the marginal reading says, You are made fullness in Him. If I've got Jesus Christ, I've got everything I need. I read a book published in 1850. And it was a good book. It was about revival, but there were some things in it with which I could not agree. Here's one thing. They talked about what they called the very inferior experience of justification in contrast to the far superior experience of sanctification. Now, I can't agree with that. Do you know why? Because Jesus Christ is both my justification and my sanctification. That's why. Doesn't it say that in 1 Corinthians chapter 1? Who of God has made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption? I have a whole Christ living within me. And that Christ living within me is my sanctification. And so when Paul said, The very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he that calls you who also will do it. I don't think there's a doctrine in the Bible that isn't related to Jesus Christ. There are doctrines that are being proclaimed today that are not really related to Jesus Christ. I'm talking about the doctrines of the Bible. I made a study of that one time. I couldn't find a doctrine that didn't end with Christ. He's the hub of the wheel. He's also the rim of the wheel. We're just the spokes. Jesus Christ is everything. Do you remember Ezekiel saw a vision of a wheel in the middle of a wheel? Remember that? Well, we're the wheel in the middle of the big wheel. God's the big wheel. We're the little wheel in the middle of the big wheel. It's God. And where that big wheel wants to go, that's where we better go. Because that big wheel, you know, doesn't feel the bumps in the road. It's when we get out of the big wheel that we get into problems. And we try to be the big wheel ourselves. And we can't do that. Christ is all. 
Christ is all I need. We sing that, but we don't really believe it. We don't think we've got enough. We want to have more. I don't need more than I have. But God needs more than he's got. God wants more of me than he has. But I've got a whole Christ. And I feel sad that there are so many people today that are chasing after shadows, hoping to get more of Christ. Well, we can grow in grace, and we can grow in knowledge, but the Christ who lives within is the whole Christ. And what I really need to do is to learn how to depend on him. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. All right. There is neither Greek nor Jew. There is neither male nor female. It says in Galatians 3, there's neither circumcision nor uncircumcision, bond nor free. There aren't any non-Greek speaking people in the world. That's not the important thing. The Eastern nations, that's not it. Christ is all. Christ is all. And in all. And you know, as far as I'm concerned, it's the most exciting truth next to salvation in the Bible. Just to know that I have a complete Christ living in me. He's my wisdom. That's what it says. He's my wisdom. He's my power, my justification, my sanctification, my righteousness. He's everything. He's all I'll ever need. And that means he's all I'll ever need in any situation in life because he's a whole Christ.